Good morning and uh, welcome from Peter and Carol Morton. Uh, it's been uh, an interesting time. We're just thankful to God for the blessings that he's given us during these uh, COVID days. We truly miss all of you and long for the day when we can be back with all of you. But as we continue to journey through these very challenging times, please remember Philippians 4 verses 6 to 7 trusting in God that he will get us through all of this. God bless all of you. Good morning, church family. We're the White Houses, and we just wanted to wish everyone a good morning. Last week's kid's story was God Makes a Way, and this week's kid's story is 10 Ways to Be Perfect. And the verse is, this is how we First John 5 Okay, big waves. Have a good week. Good morning, Memorial Baptist Church. Um, my name is uh, Eric, and my wife Valerie, and our daughters Eliana. She's one years old, one and a half, and then Julia, and then our son Zachary. Yes, four. Oh, Julia is uh, four years old. And Zachary is uh, six years old. Zachary, right now, he's at school. Uh, at uh, he's in uh, kindergarten at a, a local French school here. And so we we'd uh, uh, we we'd like to yeah give a just brief update on where we are and what's uh, upcoming for us here or the plans. So right now, the past three years, we've been living here in Saint Jerome and focusing on language learning and cultural learning here. And so now we're coming to the point of transition, moving to Montreal. Praise the Lord, um, he provided a, a condo for us in Montreal, so we're really excited to move just in a couple weeks. And uh, the time here has been such a blessing. We're so thankful for our church here, Ecclesia, and we feel we're at a really good place in, in terms of having a basis for the French language and the culture understanding as well. So we're excited to, to be at this place um, and ready to, and looking forward to moving to Montreal. 
Yeah, the uh, uh, first two years here in St. Jerome were uh, geared more for the language, cultural learning, and the relationship development. And the, this past year, there's been uh, yeah a lot, lot more opportunities for, for ministry for, with our local church. We've been pleased to be able to uh, be doing Bible studies. Um, Valerie uh, with a group of other women, myself with a group of other men. And uh, then also, yeah, there's been opportunities uh, with uh, witnessing with neighbors. And um, we, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're glad to, for opportunities to be sowing the seed of the word uh, with, uh, with, with non believers here. And so we're excited about uh, Montreal. This has been uh, part of our, well, uh, this has been a dream for us for, for many years, uh, originally for, for eventually going to Montreal. We desire to, um, we, we sense that the mission God is leading us to uh, is to, in reliance on his power, to develop disciple makers uh, of all nations and uh, church leaders uh, among the next, amongst the next generation of Quebecers. Uh, and by next generation, we have in mind thinking of uh, seeking to really invest in the lives of uh, students, college, university students young adults uh, um, in their 20s uh, in Montreal. And that's really draws us there. And then we also want to be working uh, alongside a church plant, a new church plant um, on the east side of Montreal. And uh, so, yeah, uh, we appreciate prayer for help with the uh, uh, logistics for us in getting ready to move, which is very imminent uh, in a couple of weeks. And also just pray that for uh, good opportunities to, to be talking about Jesus, talking about the gospel with um, uh, some neighbors of ours, some neighbors before we uh, leave. And uh, that, yeah, that for prayer for continued perseverance and endurance um, uh, in building relationships and seeking to sow the seed of the gospel uh, with people here in, in uh, Quebec. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your, your generous care for us, uh, your love, support for us uh, as a church family. Uh, we, we appreciate you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Good morning. It's good to be with you today. Just want to bring you some announcements before we get too heavily into things. Uh, first things first, I want to point you to the weekly email. There we have some announcements of things that we have going on, like a, a drive through baby shower. We have a Bible study going on. And in other ways, that's the best place to get connected is right there at the uh, weekly newsletter. Also, I want to let you know about what reopening steps look like for us here at Memorial. We have some vague ideas of what's going to be coming down the pipeline and when it's going to be. It looks like in late June we'll be able to meet outside again. So that's the plan is that we are able to do an outside meeting. We're going to be able to have even more people than we were able to have last year outside. So we're getting ready for that. Uh, for those of you who can't make it outside, we are going to still live stream at 9 o'clock on Sunday mornings. Just a, a simple something for those who can't make it out. So you will not uh, be missing out if you, if you need to be at home with the live stream. Also, under the conditions of the reopen, in step one, there is an opportunity for day camps. Now, we realize that it's too much right now for us to throw together a full-on VBS or a full-on day camp. But we do want to take opportunities to reach our children and our young families in the way that we can. And so what we want to do is we want to put together a kids men think tank. It's just going to be a Zoom meeting where we can share our ideas and figure out what it is that we can do in this reopening time to bring families together outdoors on our property and have that, that fellowship and that discipleship for the youngest people in our church. So watch the weekly email. We'll have a date and time for that meeting coming out this week. Let's take a moment now and go to prayer. A couple of things that I want to be certain that we take a moment to pray about. First of all, as we just mentioned, there is going to be an opportunity for a reopen. We do have a chance to start gathering again together. There are going to be a lot of complications with this, and so I want us to make this something that we handle prayerfully. So let's take a moment and pray, not only for our own church, not only for ourselves, but for our province as we go through this 
reopen process. Secondly, I want to thank God for the grace and mercy that comes with new life. This uh, two weeks ago, Rachel and Trevor welcomed in baby Willa. And this week, Vicki and Stephen have welcomed in baby David. And so this is, this is such a joy for these families and for us as a church. So let's go ahead and thank God for this. James chapter 1, starting verse 2, says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you are faced with trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. When we talk in the church about trials, oftentimes we want to focus on the idea of persecution, which is not wrong. But James lets us know that there are trials of many kinds that develop us as Christians. And, and right now in this pandemic, we're seeing trials of many kinds and people dealing with loneliness and depressions and anxieties and fears i also want us to re recognize right now that we have deb and bert the van krustums who are dealing with a another level of struggle we've been praying for bert for a year now because of the cancer that he's been dealing with and and we've just recently learned that the doctors have declared his cancer incurable this is a kind of trial, not just for their family, but for us as a church and, and coming around and, and being a peace for them, being a, a not only praying for joy, but being a means by which they find that joy and peace in Christ and in the body of the church. Why do we face these trials and what do we do with them? Well, the Bible tells us that if we face these, the perseverance when it finishes its work, because it must finish its work, we become mature and lacking in nothing. And this is the purpose, that we would 
grow in Christ. Let's pray to that end. Father God, just in these last few moments, we have experienced the beauty and the pain that this life brings. God, the joy and the struggles. And God, we recognize that you are God in both circumstances. And so God, where there is reason for celebrate, God, we celebrate you and the gifts that you give. And as a church body, we want to gather around our people and celebrate with those who celebrate. God, at the same time, we have people in our church that are hurting, some very deeply. God, may we also mourn with those who mourn. God, yes, to come to you, the Prince of Peace, and to pray that you would wrap your arms around them and give them joy and peace in their struggle and the various trials that many people are facing. But God, more than just praying for these things, God, may we make ourselves available to be the means by which you would bring peace and comfort in difficult times. God, I pray for Marshall as he brings the word. God, that you would speak clearly through him and that these words that you have revealed to your people would rest deeply in our hearts. God, I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I cannot trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Darkness fails his lovely face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the soul. Christ the soul and rock I stand 
Oh, my soul, I worship you. 
Good morning, Memorial. Would you turn with me to Matthew chapter 14? Our passage today will be uh, the first 12 verses of Matthew 14. And essentially what we're going to be covering is the beheading of John the Baptist. Let's begin by, by reading the passage in its entirety. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus. And he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He's been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Because John had been saying to him, it's not lawful for you to have her. And though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people because they held him to be a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod, so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. And prompted by her mother, she said, Give me the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was sorry. But because of his oaths and his guests, he commanded it to be given. And he sent and had John beheaded in the prison, And his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took the body and buried it. And they went and told Jesus. Now, this story serves as a bit of a a parenthetical insertion into the Gospel of Matthew. So far, right up to this point, the, the spotlight has really been on Jesus. It's been on his life and his ministry, on his teaching, his miracles, his interactions with the people. We spend a good deal of time recently just going through parables. But here suddenly the camera shifts, and it shifts to another scene. Another scene with a different set of characters. And there's even, we even get a bit of a flashback to help us understand what has been going on while the story of Jesus has been progressing. And I know I'm using a lot of kind of film and TV language here. And that's no mistake. That's on purpose. Because this story has all the makings of an R-rated HBO or Netflix series. There's affairs and jealousy and deceitfulness and gore and politics and plots of vengeance and murder. This is like a soap opera on steroids. And as disgusting and as disturbing as this story might be, it gives us a peek into what the upper echelons of society were like at the time of Christ. And Jesus, like John the Baptist, has come to proclaim the kingdom of heaven. But here we see what it it is up against. And it's up against the kingdom of darkness. And so in verse 1, we're introduced to Herod. And that's obviously a familiar name, but I want to clear up some potential confusion because there are actually four different Herods that are mentioned in the New Testament and a number of others that aren't mentioned but are part of history. It was a very common family name. In first century Palestine, to have a king named Herod was kind of like when I was in elementary school, having like a Michael or a Matthew in my class. There's always at least one and usually two or three running around. And all the Herods were descended from Herod the Great. Herod the Great was not ethnically Jewish. He was Idumean. He was an Edomite. He was descended from Esau. But he had ingratiated himself with the Roman establishment at just the right time and was given dominion over a large territory in the Middle East, which included Judea and Galilee and the surrounding regions. This was the Herod who killed all the baby boys in Bethlehem at the time of Jesus' birth. And he was absolutely insane. He murdered many, many of his family members. His brother-in-law, his mother-in-law, multiple wives, and at least three of his sons. There was a Roman historian at the time who, who had this saying when he was writing about Herod the Great. He said it was better to be his hus than his huios, which is kind of a a fun turn of phrase in the Greek, what it really means is it's better to be his pig than his son. Because Herod, although he wasn't ethnically Jewish, did abide by Jewish dietary laws. So if you were a pig, you were less likely to be slaughtered by him than if you were his son. But Herod the Tetrarch, 
who we have here, a.k.a. Herod Antipas, was one of his surviving sons. And he inherited a portion of his father's lands, which included Galilee. The, the term tetrarch means a ruler of a fourth. So he was a ruler of a portion of what his father had, but he wasn't really a king. And in this region of Galilee, obviously, is where Jesus has done most of his ministry up to this point. And as we'll see in this story, not only has he inherited a portion of his father's lands, he's also inherited a portion of his father's insecurity and cruelty. And so in the first two verses, we find out that Herod has heard of Jesus. And this isn't surprising, right? Much of what we've read so far in Matthew has happened in Galilee. And Galilee's not that big of a place. It's roughly the size of Perth County. So naturally, the news of what Jesus was doing as he's drawing crowds, as he's performing miracles, as he's teaching to the masses, naturally that would come to the attention of that region's ruler. Now in Mark's account, in Mark 6, we get uh, some extra details and we find out that there are multiple theories regarding who Jesus is that are circulated in Herod's court. Right? Some say it's Elijah. Some are like, no, no, it's a prophet of old. But Herod is convinced that Jesus is John the Baptist raised from the dead. And we find out later on that Herod desperately wanted to meet Jesus, perhaps in order to confirm this theory. And it's possible that Herod's assumption may come from a guilty conscience because he had executed John the Baptist. And then the rest of the passage, verses 3 through 12, actually describes something that has happened in the past. And Matthew records the circumstances that led up to the execution of John the Baptist to help us understand why Herod might be thinking this way. And so in 3 and 4, we, we begin to get the, the picture of what is going on. Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. So the reason that Herod seized and imprisoned John the Baptist is because that is what his new wife, girlfriend, partner, we really don't know what their legal marital status was at this point, but Herodias, this person he'd connected himself to, that was what she wanted. Now, some more background for you to help us understand what exactly is going on here. Herod, Antipas, Herod the Tetrarch, was already married. He was married to an Arabian princess who was the daughter of a neighboring kingdom. And in putting her away, that would actually spark a military conflict and he would lose and the Romans would have to swoop in and bail him out later on. And Herodias, his new love interest, was the wife of Philip, who was Herod's brother. That was until she left him and hooked up with the Tetrarch. Now, some commentators kind of place the primary blame on Herod for seeing a woman that he was infatuated with and just simply taking her. Others believe that it was Herodias herself who seduced her brother-in-law in order to gain more power and prestige. For what it's worth, my take is that they're both sinful people, evil people, lusting after things that they shouldn't have, We've heard the expression of match made in heaven, but this is much more like a match made in hell. And to make matters worse, Herodias wasn't just Herod's sister-in-law. She was also his niece. Her father was Aristobulus, Herod's older brother. So this relationship is both adulterous and incestuous. But what is anyone going to say about it? I mean, who would dare question this relationship between the son and the granddaughter of Herod the Great? Well, John the Baptist would. And he said, it's not lawful for you to have her. And he's probably referencing here Leviticus 18.16 or 20.21, which essentially says that it's unlawful to take your brother's wife. Don't sleep with your brother's wife. It's contrary to the will of God, don't do that. And so in response to this claim that John made, he's arrested and he is put in prison. And again, in Mark's account, we read that Herodias had a grudge against him and she wanted to put him to death. 
You see, for her, the fact that this man would call her out on her sexual immorality was intolerable. Who was he to tell her what she should do? To her, John the Baptist was just some religious nut job who lived in the desert with terrible fashion sense and an unrefined palate. I mean, he did wear camel hair and eat locusts after all. Meanwhile, she was a member of the royal line. She was someone important. And if John wouldn't stop with all this moral judgment and just shut up, then she wanted to shut him up permanently. But Herod, Herod wasn't so sure. Right? In verse 5, we see that he, he wanted to put John to death, but he feared the people. And he feared the people because they rightly understood that John the Baptist was a prophet of God. And so here we begin to see Herod's insecurity start to show. He's divided, he's double-minded, he's unsure. And you could say he was nervous about how executing a prophet of God might impact his polling numbers. Part of him wanted to kill John. John's public rebuke of his illegal relationship hurt his reputation, but executing John might hurt his reputation even more. He was double-minded. And perhaps he thought he could find a middle ground, that simply imprisoning John could stop the damage and keep his new girlfriend slash sister-in-law slash niece happy. But it didn't. You see, Herod was wicked and weak. But Herodias was wicked and conniving. If John the Baptist would dare to publicly call her out on her sin, then he must die. She would see it done. She just needed an opportunity. And then Herod has a birthday. Now, what we know from the contemporary sources of the day is that Herod liked to throw these opulent parties and the guest list would have been a who's who of Galilee. There was plenty of food. The drinks would have been flowing. And of course, there had to be entertainment. But this night's entertainment was unusual to say the least because Herodias' daughter, Herod's stepdaughter slash niece, grandniece, danced at the party. And this would have been scandalous because typically those who danced at these types of things would have been slaves or at the most, women of very, very low class. But here was a young woman of noble birth of the royal line who was entertaining at the party. And she was young. And because of the Greek word used in the text, most commentators guess that she was probably about 12 to 14 at the most. And I think it's fair to say that Herod was not a refined and professional dance critic. So when it says he was pleased, we can get a picture of what's going on here. And knowing who this girl is in relation to him, we ought to understand how unsavory this entire situation really is. But he is pleased. And so the king foolishly offers her whatever she wants. In Mark's account, it actually includes his, his exact words. And he essentially says the same thing that the king of Persia said to Esther. Anything up to half my kingdom I will give you. But Herod the Tetrarch was far from the emperor of Persia. He wasn't even a real king. He was writing checks that he simply couldn't cash. He was wicked, he was weak, and he was foolish. And with that promise, now the opportunity finally appeared. The trap had been sprung, so urged on by her mother, the girl asks for John the Baptist's head on a platter. And in verse 9, it says that the king was sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. Now, the Bible has many stories where evil people do evil things. But let's be sure to grasp the depravity and the wickedness of what has just happened. Because she'd been called out on her sinful relationship, Herodias got her very young daughter to seductively dance for the girl's stepdad slash uncle and his friends. So that when Herod rewarded her, she could ask for the head of a prophet of God on a plate. And then this decapitated head was presented to this girl in front of this crowd of people, and then she dutifully brought it to her mother. This is the kingdom of darkness at work here. 
And just because he was sorry doesn't mean Herod gets a pass here or is deserving of any sympathy. He wanted John dead too, but he didn't initially kill him because he was afraid of the people. Ironically, it was again because of the opinions of others, this time his guests, that he went through with the execution. It was his own sinful tendencies that caused him to make such a rash promise, but following through on that oath was even worse. Yes, he was sorry, but there are two different kinds of sorrow. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. And this was obviously worldly sorrow. And so when it's all done, the disciples of John the Baptist came and they took the body and they buried it and they went and told Jesus. And so what do we do with this passage? I mean, so far we spend time understanding what it is that is happening And I've presented some additional context and information to help us wrap our minds around how terrible this whole situation is. But what is the application? What is it that we're supposed to take from this story? Part of my preparation for sermons involves asking the question of what the main idea is. What are the applications that we ought to draw from this? And in my notes, I wrote down as concisely as I could what I feel the call to actions are here. And there are three very, very simple things. Be like John. Don't be like Herod. And trust the process. You see, John, in his purpose, his purpose in ministry was to prepare the way for Christ. He was the forerunner. And this mission is kind of summed up in Matthew 3, verse 2. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. God's plan for salvation is underway. The kingdom is coming, so repent and believe. And a prophet served as a mouthpiece for God. They spoke to the people on behalf of God. You see, often when we think of prophets and prophecy, we emphasize this kind of glamorous aspect of what they did, right? It's all about predicting the future, right? Modern day prophets are all about predicting the future. That is what they do. That is their business. But when you study the lives of the prophets and you read the prophetic books of the Bible, you will quickly see they spend much more time calling out sin and calling the people, both Israel and the Gentile nations, to repentance. Think of Elijah fighting against the idolatry that was imposed by Ahab and Jezebel. In fact, there are are actually a lot of parallels here between Ahab, Jezebel, and Elijah versus Herod, Herodias, and John the Baptist. We can also think of Jonah. Jonah was sent to warn Nineveh, the enemies of God. He was sent to warn them of God's judgment and and call them to repent, which they did, even though Jonah was a little bit disappointed by that. So when John tells Herod that the relationship with his brother's wife is unlawful, there is in that this implicit call to repentance. This is wrong. God hates this. Stop this. Turn from this. Walk in holiness. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. John doesn't just preach this message to the unwashed masses or the religious elite, but even to those among the upper echelons of society because it doesn't matter what your station in life is. The law of God is the basis by which all humanity will be judged. We cannot atone for our sins. Only Christ can do that. But we are called to repentance. And as those who have been tasked to proclaim the gospel, to evangelize the lost, this is part of what we are called to do. You can't divorce God's righteous judgment of the wicked from the hope of the gospel. The good news is only good news if you understand the bad news. What are we saved from? Why did Jesus have to die? What happens if we reject him? What happens if we don't repent? Now, we understand obviously that calling others to repentance needs to be tempered with grace and with gentleness. And you don't need me to tell you how this has been done improperly. How the gospel has been preached in an abusive way. 
all judgment and no grace is a corruption that is both harmful and contrary to Scripture. But so is a gospel that doesn't call for repentance. Now, repentance is not an end in and of itself. It's not simply about moral reform. It's a turning away from sin and a turning towards God. It's not about becoming a better person. It's about dying to yourself and finding life in Jesus Christ. So we proclaim the truth in love. But even then, it may not be well received. In this way, not much has changed in the last 2,000 years. People still don't like being told that they're wrong. They don't like being told that their deeds or their words or even their thoughts are evil and offensive to God. Sometimes I wonder if the fact that I don't personally experience more persecution in my life is because I go to great lengths. I take great pains not to offend anyone. And is it possible that this is true of the Western church in general? We don't want to upset anyone. We don't want to upset them on their headlong journey towards destruction. And in our attempts to make the gospel more palatable, we're tampering with the true message. See, John the Baptist knew that there might be consequences for speaking the truth, but he was not afraid. John did not fear anyone or anything except God. Herod, on the other hand, seems to have feared everything except God. First, he feared the impact that John's preaching would have on his reputation and also that of his wife slash sister-in-law slash niece. And so he arrested John. He was also thinking of Herodias and what she thought, right? And by all accounts, she was a spiteful and manipulative woman. But he didn't kill John because he was afraid, right? He was afraid that the people would be upset by this news and that that would impact his hold on the region. It wasn't because he feared God. John was a prophet of the Almighty, a man set apart, Herod had no right to lay a finger on him. If he feared God, he never would have touched him. But then after he makes this reckless oath as a thanks for his sick entertainment, he does go ahead and kill John. And again, it's out of fear. This time though, right, he didn't want to lose face in front of his esteemed guests. He didn't want people to question his generosity. And sure, he was sorry. But he was simply sorry that he put himself between a rock and a hard place. He was sorry that he found himself in a lose-lose situation because either way, this could hurt his reputation. Herod wanted to satisfy his own desires while maintaining control, while keeping everyone else happy enough to just let him do his thing. And that way of life is a trap. And it's a trap that we can so easily fall into. I was reminded of the words of Joshua just before he died. He, he goes to the people and he says, Choose this day whom you will serve. And that choice still stands before us. And John chose to serve the Lord. And Herod chose to serve himself. And in doing so, he killed a man who Jesus says was the greatest man to have ever been born. And that's how it ends. But the way that this story ends just leaves us wanting more, doesn't it? Right? This doesn't make sense. It offends our concept of righteousness. It's not fair. All John did was speak the truth. All he did was what God had called him to do, and for that he's beheaded. Meanwhile, this wicked and weak and perverted King Herod goes on living a life of luxury. It's the kind of thing that the psalmist lamented over. Psalm 94 3 to 7. How long shall the wicked exult? They pour out their arrogant words. All the evildoers boast. They crush your people, O Lord, and afflict your heritage. They kill the widow and the sojourner and murder the fatherless. And they say, the Lord does not see. The God of Jacob does not perceive. Why do the wicked prosper? Why do the righteous suffer? Sometimes the kingdom of darkness seems to have the upper hand and it's unsettling and it's frustrating 
It's infuriating at times. But our God is playing the slow game. And when the enemy seems to have won the day, the Lord is ready to claim the ultimate victory. Even what the enemy means for evil, God will turn for our good and for his glory. And there is a pattern for this laid out in Scripture. The early church writer Tertullian wrote that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And after all of this took place, it wouldn't be long until Jesus himself would face execution, although he was innocent. And this was arranged by the plotting of evil men. And Herod himself will make a brief uh, appearance in this story as well. Jesus is brought before him, and at this point, Jesus is beaten and bloodied. And he spent all night being assaulted and ridiculed. And Herod has questions for Jesus. And he demands to see a miracle, but Jesus doesn't answer his questions. And he doesn't perform a sign. Jesus has absolutely nothing to say to Herod. Jesus knows this man, and he knows his heart better than Herod knows himself. So Herod mocks him and sends him back to Pilate, and Jesus is crucified. And the crucifixion of Christ seems to be the ultimate victory for the enemy. The ultimate victory for the kingdom of darkness. But in reality, it would prove to be the downfall. When the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper, trust the process. God is working. Now I want to give you a bit of a, a short epilogue. Something that happened years later. Years later, Herod the Tetrarch, Herod Antipas, was persuaded by his wife, Herodias, to go to the emperor Caligula and demand a crown and the title of king. He was tired of being a tetrarch. He wanted to be a real king. But due to the plotting of his nephew, another Herod, this one named Herod Agrippa, he was accused of uh, treason. And he was stripped of titles and his land and his wealth. And he was exiled where he lived out the remainder of his days. Herod lost everything. He didn't even get his crown. But you know who did get a crown? John the Baptist. James 1.12 says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And God, sometimes in Scripture we read things that upset us and frustrate us, that seem at odds with our human concept that, that good things should happen to good people and bad things should happen to bad people. But Lord, I pray that we would trust in your sovereign plan. God, I pray that you would give us the boldness to preach your gospel, which includes a call to repentance, and give us the wisdom to balance that the strength of that call with the gentleness you've called us to, to speak to others with. Lord, I pray that we would be guarded from the mindset of Herod. I pray that we wouldn't fall into the trap of pleasing ourselves and pleasing others and trying to maintain control over, over what is around us, God, but instead we would submit ourselves to you and understand that you are ultimately in control. And God, when, when things seem to fall apart, when the righteous suffer, and when the wicked prosper, help us to trust in you, that you are working for our good and for your glory. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. May you come to trust in his sovereign plan. And may you be a willing participant in his plan to proclaim the gospel to the lost. Go in peace.